Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Business of Property. I am your host, Cheryl Leong from Property Development Australia. At the Business of Property, we interview superstar guests in the property development space that share their expertise, their deals, and their stories to help empower, build, and grow our community of property developers and investors. So hello to Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube land. If you're watching the replay, comment in whatever spot it is, um, below or to the left or to the right and put in your questions. Our guest for today is Mark Baker from Super Cashflow Property. And for those of you who have been in the communities and things like that, you've probably seen Mark and his son Stuart Baker around talking about their experience and um, the projects that they're doing around the rooming house space. Mark has been investing in cash flow property for 30 years, um, over 30 years to live solely off the income from his investment properties. Um, and he's currently the company secretary and director of the Registered Accommodation Association of Victoria, who is the peak industry body of rooming houses in that state. And so before I welcome Mark on board, the, the main gist of our conversation today is going to be around the regulatory side of rooming houses and how we can run these um, these very high cash flow, high yield properties. So without further ado, I wish to invite Mr. Mark Baker onto the Business of Property dance floor. <laughs> how are you, Cheryl? I'm really well, Mark. Thank you for being here. How are you doing? Um, I'm doing well. I mean, I'm recovering from being unwell for the last week, but that's okay. Uh, getting back uh, excellent. Well, it's good, good to have you here. Mark, tell us how you got into this whole realm of high cash flow and you said you've been doing this for 30 years so yeah longer than a lot of us have been born <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hopefully i don't look that old but anyway um i've look i started investing in property back i suppose quite a while ago when i was fairly young <laughs> so about 1992 um and my focus at the time like was always, you know, if I'm going to buy a property, it's got to make money. I'd hear people talking about you know, negative gearing and all that sort of stuff. And to yeah. me, it never made sense. I thought, well, I haven't got a great income. If I'm buying a property that's costing me money, I can't afford too many of those. And you know, my aim was always to buy more. So I had to buy properties that made money. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of how I started and sort of built up from there and you know, ran other businesses and pumped money into buying positive cash flow properties. And it's probably about... 12 years ago now that um you know through running a variety of businesses and some of the businesses you know had done well some hadn't you know lost some money um and i thought well you know really it's property that's always carried me through you know business has been up and down and property's always carried me through so I made the decision um back then to go and say well okay i need to figure out how i'm going to live full time off property and mm. Um, it was actually a customer in one of the businesses that suggested to me, why don't you do what I do? And it's like, what is it that you do? Oh, well, I rent out rooms in the house. And it's like, tell me about how that works. And yeah, got started in it. And from there, just went, you know, continued on and on and on with it and you know, learned more and more about it. Just read the legislation, understood how things work, got involved in you know, the industry association. You mentioned before the Registered Accommodation Association, Victoria. Um, you know, learned from other people who'd been doing it longer than I had um, and, you know, just put everything together. Uh, it, and it was pretty challenging to begin with because, you know, as we're going to talk about, there's a heap of different legislation and regulations that apply and you can't really find all that in one spot. I mean, there's mm. building code, so you can talk to building surveyors about that. There's stuff under health regulations, so you can talk to the you know, council health department about that. There's planning requirements. There's, you know, how you manage or operate them because it's pretty different to normal property management. And yeah, I, I found people that knew their small part of it, like the building side or you know, the planning side or whatever, but to put the whole picture together, um, that was something that I spent a fair bit of time learning off everyone I could to put everything together so it all made sense. Mm. And and Mark, and because that's the thing, people sort of go, oh, I can start renting out rooms. Mm. And you know, two hundred dollars each. And so, what's the pitfall of, I guess, just doing? And 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 I put a disclaimer as well. Predominantly, you focus on Victoria, so a lot of the legislation yep. that you're talking about is relates um, to Victoria. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I'm familiar with some of the other states as well, but yeah, you're right. I'm pretty active in Victoria. Um, I suppose the primary things are, um, yeah. Well, if we talk building code, well, national construction code, because that's national, um, supplies across the whole country. But the primary reason for things in the national construction code are around occupant safety. So, okay. yeah, if you've got multiple people living in a building, um, yeah, and well, I suppose the way to describe it, if you've got a family home and you've got a heap of people living there or even a group of friends that decide to get together and rent a house and share the house, they all know one another. They probably like one another. Um, <laughs> they're going to you so may not. An issue of fire in Sorry? You may or may not like each other. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's a different thing. <laughs> but the, yeah, but the, the, the way it's looked at is they're likely to look out for one another. So if there's an issue, say a fire in the house, they're going to make sure you're going to make sure your family's out. You're going to make sure your mates get out. Um, yeah, you probably haven't got locked doors, so it's easy to get people out. If you've got multiple tenancies in the property where people have got separate agreements, and specifically if you've got locked doors, um, and it may be people you don't know, you may or may not like them, you may not even know whether they're home or not. You're not really interested. Mm, uh, mm, so mm. there's requirements in the building code for additional fire safety and you know, early warning. You know, like interconnected smoke alarms, evacuation lighting, all that sort of stuff, to make sure that you know, it's a safer environment for multiple tenancies. Um, so that's the yeah, building side of things. Of course, there's planning requirements that vary state to state. So whether it's a permitted use in that zone, um, what the parking requirements are for that use, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and a whole heap of other stuff. Then there's also, um, like if we talk specifically Victoria, but you know, Queensland has similar stuff as well. There's minimum standards for you know, amenity in the property. So you know, what, you've, what you've got to have as far as types of door locks, you know, to be able to exit the property without a key. Um, you know, standards for what you're required for dining facilities, you know, laundry facilities, you know, all that sort of stuff. There's a whole heap of standards and regulations that need to be met. And we've talked about, you know, three pieces of legislation so far, and there's more. I mean, Victoria's got licensing as well. So you need to have a license to operate a rooming house in Victoria, and it's not a real estate license, it's a different licensing scheme. So, yeah, there's a whole heap of requirements, but a lot of it comes about you know, from the mindset of occupant safety, which I think is pretty important. <laughs> and so in, in terms of sort of directly converting a residential home into what yep. would end up being separate tenancies and things like that what are the things that we need to consider like it's not so really is it illegal to be renting out rooms i mean let's start off is it illegal to rent out individual rooms to begin with yeah um well technically yes um but it'll depend under what legislation as well so mm. um i mean a lot of people will say yeah let's let's continue on with victoria and yeah there's different numbers in different states like queensland's the same new south wales a bit higher there's a definition of rooming house that pretty much every every piece of legislation uses. It comes from the Residential Tenancies Act in Victoria, which is you know, one or more rooms available for rent to four or more people. So I hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, if it's not four people, then it's not a rooming house um, and I don't mm -hmm. need to comply with anything else. Um, so you're right in that it's not a rooming house. But you're not right in the fact that it's not still a multiple tenancy and the building code still applies. So, um, Actually, I'll probably, I, mean, I, I can um, either get it up or post it a bit later. I've got a copy of a building notice um, from Victoria. Actually, if I can get that up, I might be able to stick it up on the screen anyway. Uh, maybe not, or I can, I can send it through later. Yeah. Um, a copy of a building notice, um, I'll, I'll post it later, uh, where on the building notice it says, you know, the use of the building contravenes the Building Act and that the building is being occupied in contravention of the current occupancy permit. Um, and you know, in this case, the building is being occupied by three unrelated persons, as ah. if the building is classified with an occupancy permit for this usage hasn't been obtained. So that was nothing saying it has to be a rooming house, but the building owner says it still needs to be Class 1B because there's multiple tenancies, even though there's only three of them. So mm. there is still building requirements, regardless of whether property needs to be registered as a rooming house or not. Um, yeah. Obviously, that means there's some 
regulations that don't apply. So for that, not a rooming house, don't need a license, don't need to register with council, but the building still has to be the right classification for the use. Mm -hmm. So um, you touched really briefly about the classification of 1B. Can you just talk through high level what what yeah, sure. makes a one B building? Yeah, I suppose I've jumped into it a bit, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, so National Construction Code has, and we touched on the fire safety stuff before. There's mm. a heap of building classifications. So a standard house that you know people would live in is Class One A. Um, class One A is a detached dwelling, you know, or horizontally separated. If you've got vertical separation like apartments. That moves into mm. class two. Um, mm. With the use as a rooming house, there's two classifications in the National Construction Code, and they're class 1B, um, which is a you know, small or domestic scale. So that's a house of up to 300 square metres that um, can accommodate up to a maximum of 12 people. And again, that's national. The next building classification would be class three, and that's once you exceed either of those things. Now, there's other uses for those building classes, like a bed and breakfast, for example, is also either class 1B or class 3, a guest house, a hotel. Like most hotels have got more than um, mm. you know, 12 people in them and <laughs> more than 300 square metres, so they're all class 3. Um, but if you had a you know, a small motel or bed and breakfast, you know, they can be class 1B as well. Um, so, yeah, and there's a heap of different building classifications. Um, so, yeah, Class 1B is basically the permitted use for multiple tenancy buildings. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you've got a residential house that you're renting out to separate people to begin with and it's a Class yep. 1A, it, it doesn't tick the box of yeah. rooming. That's right. That's right. It needs to be changed to a classification that permits that use. Yeah. And to change, and then and then the other thing to consider as well is that you, again you touched on it twelve maximum of twelve people. Yep. Um, but that doesn't mean it's twelve rooms. No. No, and this is where we get into other things as well. Like, um, yeah, in the planning scheme, um, so you can get a planning permit to do something with twelve rooms, or you can go dig a class three or whatever, but. Victoria has a fairly broad planning exemption that typically means you can do up to nine bedrooms. Mm -hmm. um, fairly straightforward to do. Uh, yeah, Brisbane has a different one. So Brisbane, you can do up to five occupants. You know, Gold Coast, you can do up to four. Um, and various interpretations in different councils there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, new South Wales have brought out some new policies and they're sort of, depending on zoning, you know, 12 isn't too difficult there, but there's other requirements that would blow out the building size. So, yeah, there's other factors to consider. So, but from a planning point of view, um, that's usually what, well, pseudo limits your number of rooms. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. how much harder it is if you want to go bigger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, so and if you're saying, it's usually easier to do what you can do <laughs> fast. Let's say, you know, one one B, nine bedrooms, maximum of 12 people. So, yep. Obviously, there are rooms that are sort of what you'd say double double couple couple rooms or whichever. Yeah, sure. And what's this three hundred square meters requirement? So that's um, well, that's in a couple of places, but the primary one is in the National Construction Code. So it's three hundred square meters total um, floor area of the Class One B part of the building, as measured by the enclosing walls. Mm. Um, in Victoria, they have added a requirement in the planning scheme as well, that it's a maximum um, you know, total floor area of 300 square metres as well to meet the planning exemption. Um, and there's a little, there's a few issues with the interpretation of planning versus building, but uh, not, too, not too difficult to navigate. But basically 300 square metres is your maximum building yeah. size without it starting to get fairly costly. Like I said, it doesn't it mean does you can't that, go bigger. Yeah. Um, so the question was, does that include garage? Because most houses are built with garages. Yeah. <laughs> this is where you start getting into technical questions again. From a building point of view, no, because a garage is a class 10A part of the building. Um, yeah. From a planning point of view, an attached garage is often being interpreted by 
councils as being included in the total floor area. So mm -hmm. look, I think that's something we may see further clarification in the planning scheme. There has been a couple of amendments to clarify some of that in the last couple of years. Um, at the moment, that's a problematic interpretation from a planning point of view in Victoria. Only Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only, so only in Victoria. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the yeah, point, so I mean, just in quick, quick summary, the things where you have people that are looking to, you know, they've got investment properties and they're like, I'm earning $450 a week on this, on this five bedroom house. I want to be able to to maximize my rental yield. So the op, there are options there where you can potentially refurbish, retrofit, and change it into a rooming house. But yeah, sure. what are what are some of the things that people need to consider in considering that as one of the options? Look, there's a couple of I suppose a couple of things with it. One is you would want to make sure you've got you know, plans to confirm the size of the building. Um, yeah, well ways, yeah, if we're doing you know, doing these four people, we get um, yeah, some accurate plans done and we start a conversation with the council to make sure that the council's on board as well and agrees yeah. with our interpretation of what we're doing before we start spending too much money on the property. Um, yeah. There's you know, usually always a solution unless the property's massive. Um, like if you're way over 300 square metres, yeah, we'd need to look at possible solutions, but it just might not be a suitable property um, mm. just because it's going to cost you too much to do it. Um, mm. The other things that need to be looked at, uh, you know, what you're providing in terms of amenity, um, I suppose the, th the thing that I look at is you want to make each person's rent and area as comfortable as possible. And I always describe, make the common area as uncomfortable as possible because that's where the fights happen, right? <laughs> Keep them apart. Yeah. So stress um, that stress that bit again, Mark, because it's not about providing a separate living lounge with TVs and all of that. You actually want to make it uncomfortable. Oh, and why, I, is that? Yeah, why is that? My aim is to make common areas uncomfortable because I want people to spend their time apart. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. if it's, it's not like we, we touched on before. It's not like a share house where it's a heap of people that have chosen to live together and yeah, it's wine and cheese on Friday and we'll sit around and watch Netflix. Yeah. That might happen occasionally where you get a few people get along, but typically people don't want to live with other people. They want their own private space. So mm. we'll always aim to make private space, you know, each room um, as comfortable as possible so that that's where people want to spend their time and common areas, yeah, yeah. uncomfortable. So that we minimise the number of fights in the property and minimise the number of disputes. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, some of the considerations, I didn't touch on this, but National Construction Code um, since 2011 also brought in a requirement for disability access for Class 1B buildings. Um, that does create some challenges. Now, there can be some dispensations or deemed to satisfy provisions that can be negotiated when doing a change of use of an existing building based on the age and nature of the building. If you're building new, you're meeting, the current, you're meeting the building code and you're doing disability access. Mm. If you're converting a property, not always straightforward, but we can often look at other ways of you know, achieving the desired outcome and getting a solution for people. Mm. Um, yeah, the bottom line of it is that you know, we've had a massive rise in NDIS and you've probably had people talk about NDIS properties. There's um, yeah, a lot of other products available for people who are living with a disability um, mm -hmm. and there's just not the demand, there's not the demonstrated demand in rooming. Um, I'm not opposed to providing access to people with a disability, but it's got to be appropriate to the use and function of you know, what people yeah. need, yeah. not just a blanket rule, one size fits all. So yeah. that's the other thing to consider is, you know, if you've got to do that, can that be achieved? What other possible solutions might there be? And so, just really briefly as well, what does universal access require? Does that mean like, you know, ramps, wider doorways, bathrooms? Are there some of the things that you need to consider when you're looking at disability or universal access? Yeah, look, if you've got to provide that, there's, there's a bit to it. Um, yeah, it's a simplistic approach to go and say wider doorways. There's also circulation space around doorways. Yeah, mm. If the doorway's at the end of the hall, then it needs to be even wider at the end of the hall. So there's circulation space around doorways as well. 
Um, mm. yeah, same with bathrooms. So it's the larger, well, not only the larger bathroom, but yeah, shower seat, things at specific heights. Again, mm. yeah, space either side of the door, um, yeah, just circulation space around the doorways. Um, but that's the primary things. Um, and it's interesting some of the things that they've picked to have. So there is the bathroom and access to um, other spaces like access to the kitchen, access to the laundry or whatever, but nothing requiring the laundry or kitchen itself to be accessible, just that, yeah, someone in a wheelchair yeah. can get there. So, so you just can't do your laundry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, it's 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 pretty rare that there's much demand for someone um, yeah. with a disability in a rooming house because there are other, you know, there's plenty of other suitable accommodation and especially with the rise of NDIS over the last few years, there's a, a lot more being provided in yeah. that space. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think there's other suitable accommodation. But um, look, we're not getting away from it. There's more requirements coming into the National Construction Code May next year and the next amendments for you know, more access requirements, even in standard dwellings, you know, circulation mm. spaces, endless entries and all that sort of stuff. So um, you know, reality is it's just something we've got to design around um, and it, it's the way things are going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so one of the then let's move into the new stuff now. So we talk, we've we've, sure. we've touched briefly on the conversions, the fact that you can potentially, you know, reconfigure, put in some doors. Yeah, you know, whether it's a more more little en suites and things. And why why is it a better? Is it one to begin? It is it a better outcome to still purpose built and why? Uh, look, purpose built. And I suppose for the things I touched on before is is definitely um, a, a better product, um, and we can go through a number of the reasons for that. But yeah, the um, interesting thing is, um, you know, I suppose if you look at a standard house, a standard house was designed to be a family home. Right? Mm. So, like we talked about before with the living areas, there's larger common living areas. Bedrooms are typically quite small. Um, they're not intended for people to be spending too much time in there. And you go there to sleep, you, you know, add in the dining room or family room or whatever, watching TV with your family. Um, mm. And yeah, you're not too concerned about, you know, because people are only sleeping in there, so you're not too concerned about any you know, noise mitigation or anything like that between rooms. So when you're purpose building, you can add you know, a heap of other stuff. You can put more soundproofing between the rooms. Um, mm. So that you're not woken up by your neighbour snoring who you don't know, right? <laughs> um, you make the rooms you know larger and more comfortable. So instead of just you know just fitting a bed and not much else, you can fit you know, a comfortable tub chair or whatever, and you can have you know, mm. um, somewhere you can sit and you know, a study desk or you know, somewhere comfortable to watch TV in your own room in your own private space. Um, so there's a whole heap of things you can design differently. Uh, when it's purpose built for that, you know, multiple tenancy use, um, mm. and have you know, less of a shared aspect about it, and less interruption or intrusion from the noise that other people might make in their rooms. So definitely a far better outcome when the property is purpose built for use. Yeah. Um, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, we touched on some management of that before as well. You know, much easier if you're treating as you know individual tenancies rather than having to deal with too much you know, interaction and conflict between people. So yeah. however you can design it to minimise that conflict, um, mm. yeah, far better out. Mm. And, and so a that's a good, yeah, a good segue into managing the, these properties because you, you get these questions yeah. all the time, right? How do you manage you know, <laughs> nine, 12 people, different personalities, different noises, that sort of thing? Um, yep. You you manage you manage the properties for your own and clients as well. What's the yes. secret sauce between? It's not property management. It's room management. It's all it's people management as well. It's it's a lot more to do with the people, yeah, than it is the property. So um, there's there's a fair bit to it, um, and yeah, it's. Like, I suppose a bit of a different setup, and I did mention before the rooming house operators licensing in Victoria. So rather than doing it as property management, 
Um, we take on the complete role as operator. So we enter into a commercial agreement with the owner of the properties and we operate under our license, which means we have more autonomy and make more decisions. And that way we can deal with things a lot faster. Uh, I think one of the key things in this space is responsiveness. Um, yeah, if you look at, um, when I suppose we look through property management, if people are in individual houses, there's not really too much of an issue. I mean, if they've got an issue with the neighbours, yeah, probably they can sort that out. It doesn't affect too many other people. As you get into apartment buildings, you've then also got an owner's corporation manager who manages the stuff to do with the common areas. Um, so a rooming house is sort of like a combination between those. You've got not only to deal with the tenancies, you've got to deal with common area and interactions between people as well. Um, and to do that, you need to be yeah, reasonably responsive. You need to be yeah, getting on top of issues really quickly before they go out and become something bigger. Um, and some of that can come down to even at the beginning, like responsiveness when you're getting inquiries and an assessment of people to make sure they're going to be a good fit. Yeah, not that, not that you want them you know, living together as such, but they are living under the same roof. So yeah, you can't have people that are going to be too disruptive to other people. So yeah, you need to assess things pretty quickly early on and pretty quickly. Um, so, and you've got to be yeah, say very active. Uh, you know, not like in normal property management where you might you know, deal with an issue every now and then and you know, visit the property every six months. Um, you know, we've got someone at the properties probably every you know, week or two, <laughs> sometimes more yeah. often depending on what's happening. Just checking on mm. what's going on, managing, maintaining common areas, yeah, uh, yeah. making sure that yeah, people aren't doing things that are too disruptive and, yeah, mm. and keeping on top of things. So it's, it's very active. Yeah. And, means, and how often are you able, because like standard property management, you can um, arrange a viewing of the pro or inspection of the property every yeah. six months. Is that right? What's, yeah, what, yeah. Is, there, is there a difference with, with rooming? Yeah, there is because the, um, the residency agreement's on the room. So... Um, you won't only need to be giving notice for accessing rooms or a room that someone has exclusive possession of. Typically, again, we're talking Victoria, but under the rooming house section of the Act, you can inspect rooms every four weeks. Mm. Um, yeah, unless there's some issue happening or some, you know, you've got some concerns, you probably don't typically need to do it that often. But the mm. point is that you can. As far as mm. common area goes, because that is common area, and we talked about block of units before. So in a block of units, the owner's corporation manages the common area. They can deal with that at any time, you know, deal with maintenance in common area, all that sort of stuff. So same sort of thing. Access to common areas of the building anytime. Um, it's just to, you know, private rooms where people have exclusive possession that you'd need to have, you know, notice and a right of entry. And that's you know, every four weeks you can, you can do that. But there's also other requirements too. Like I mentioned before, the fire safety stuff, there'll be essential safety measures requirements on the occupancy permit where you've got to maintain um, you know, those fire safety devices. So yeah. if you've got to maintain those, you need to be able to access the property for that as well. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of when you're doing sort of interviewing people to move into these rooms, Yep. Yeah, is that something special that you need to do differently to a standard property management interview? Um, look, it, it varies, I suppose. I mean, there's a number of markets, uh, and I suppose it varies a little bit on who that market is, but you do want to try and find out a little bit of history, like have they lived in similar style of accommodation before? Do they know what they're getting into? Mm. Um, mm. The, in some ways, you probably, I mean, it's, it's, I suppose, a bit of a learned skill. In some ways, you in some cases, taking a little bit more of a gamble with people, like whether you think they're going to be a good fit, how they present, um, mm -hmm. you know, and making some decisions based on that rather than trying to rely too much on what they have in terms of, you know, rental history because you do get a lot of young people that don't have much of a rental history either. Mm. So, and you know, they need to get a start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, if you're actively managing, you can keep things running pretty smoothly. 
Yeah. And what are the requirements if you find that someone's not the right fit, they're a pain in the bum bum to work with, oh, well, to live <laughs> with more than anything else? Yep. What are the requirements for notice? Because it needs to I mean, tenancy regulations are generally in sort of in favour of the tenant, right? Yeah. Yeah, look, there's a little bit more control in the rooming house section because it is recognised that there's people living together. Um, the notice periods are shorter, but there still needs to be an at-fault reason. Um, mm -hmm. Look, if, if there's just conflict between people, often it can be yeah, a conversation with them to say, hey, look, yeah, this isn't working out. Um, yeah, you're really going to need to find somewhere else. Um, yeah, we're not going to go with anything yet, but we need to agree that it's not working and you need to you know, be looking at getting on the move. The other thing that I find pretty handy is because you know, I'm oper operating a reasonable number of them. Um, I find sometimes if someone's not a good fit in one house, they might be right in another house. So we can sometimes move people between houses to resolve issues pretty quickly as well. Mm. And depending on what areas we've got and what vacancies we've got, but sometimes that can be a faster solution if we've got that available. But a lot of the time it's just you know, communication and dealing with people and say, you know, open communication. Um, yeah. But the, like I said, the notice periods under that section of the Act are a lot shorter. I mean, if we talk about rent arrears, for example, um, I, find, I still find this bizarre. In the general tenancy section in Victoria, there is no breach of duty to not pay your rent on time for a normal house. To me, that's just bizarre. How can you pay your rent late and that's okay? Um, mm. And the only recourse in, that, in the general tenancy section is 14 days late, you get a 14 day notice to vacate. You may not necessarily want somebody out, you just want them to pay their rent. Yeah. In the rooming yeah. house section, it's a breach of duty to not pay your rent on time. So you can issue someone with an official notice under the Act if they're late paying their rent. And that can escalate to you know, notice to vacate if they're late three times if you really wanted to. But the main point, I think, is to try and get it paid. Um, hmm. And even for a notice to vacate, I mean, it can be a two day notice to vacate once there's seven days in arrears on rent. So much faster to be able to deal with issues. Um, and incidentally, that's one of the things that attracted me to begin with when I started doing you know, rooming houses for long 12 years ago was the ability to deal with issues faster. Mm. So, and um, as more, flexi more flexibility and more control for yeah. the rooming house operator. Yeah, because yeah, I had, I'd had lots of issues with standard tenancies. I'm sure lots of people who've yeah, yeah. invested in property have had. Um, yeah. And yeah, not to say that I don't with rooming. I mean, there's still issues and they're probably a little bit more amplified because you've got more people under one roof. But the ability yeah. to deal with things so much faster is what, what was attractive to me. Yeah. So, I mean, the question will then be because there's a lot, a bit more involvement and there's sort of more hands on, what does that translate to in terms of the cost to run a rooming? Like, is it still worthwhile when you've got these extra costs and of the the turnover of of tenants as well what's yep. your experience in that regard um look I've, I've gone pretty full on into it so from my point of view it's been worthwhile um it's look it's definitely it's definitely more work and there's you know, definitely more costs involved in doing it but mm. when you talk about you know, if you're buying a standard house that brings in you know 500 a week compared to something that brings in two two and a half thousand a week it's mm. like even if you're spending a thousand dollars more a week on expenses, which you're not, you're still a thousand dollars a week better off. Mm. So, mm. Um, yeah, it's it's not all of a sudden you're getting four or five times the income. You're not. You're probably netting you know, two or three times the income um, because there is more work. And then I suppose there's the decision there: Are you cut out for that? Do you want to deal with the people yourself, or do you want to engage someone else to do it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I will say, I mean, there's, look, there's a, a lot of um, property managers out there going and putting themselves out to the rooming, and my experience has been a lot of them aren't great. Um, I have met some that are, a lot aren't, and I think it's a different approach on it as well. Um, I haven't touched on this, but, yeah, the Residential Tenancies Act has multiple sections in it, multiple parts. So there's your normal tenancies, there's rooming houses, even caravan parks are covered in the Residential Tenancies Act. Mm. And I you often know, ask people, it's like, would you go buy a caravan park and go get your local real estate agent to manage it for you? 
Good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then I asked the question, what makes you think they can do rooming houses? Yeah, if they've got a proven track record, a different story, or if there's a reason they can do it. Like there's a um, a real estate agency I know that does rooming houses very well, and the director of the agency also owns rooming houses, so of course he understands them quite well. Um, yes. Yeah, but there's others where that's not the case, and they just think, yeah, oh, well, we can get rent off nine rooms, yeah, we want to do that, and they just treat mm. it like normal property management, and mm. it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. They're not good at dealing with conflicts. They're not good at dealing with um, issues with the property. They think they can just turn up every six months and they just don't provide a service. So to, look, so bottom line is to have it done properly by someone else, it'll cost you more than normal property management because you need someone who's more active and more responsive. Hmm. So I'm going to swing back around a bit, Mark, because, you know, the very, very beginning we talked around the why you were attracted to this because of the cash flow and all that and we you know yep. the other question we often get will be well you've got great cash flow but but you might not get great capital growth yep what do you have to say to um, that? I, look I, I can say to that i've had pretty i mean everywhere's gone up <laughs> it's like i've had some pretty huge capital growth especially in the last few years um but the reality is i don't care um, mm. you know, what, what are you going to do with the capital growth? Um, you know, to realise that you've either got to sell more property or you know, refinance if you can to pull more debt out. Most people's mm. long-term goals is to pay down debt anyway. Mm. So if you pay down the debt, then the capital value doesn't really matter um, mm. as long as you're producing an income from it. One of the things I will say is that rooming houses are probably more an end game strategy. If you're building up, because so, you know, they can be equity heavy and there'll be money tied up in them. Mm. Um, there's some different finance products coming out, but they're not always the easiest thing to finance. Uh, but the cash flow from them is great. And yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I mean, I can use some examples. A lot of properties that didn't cost much. I mean, if it started a little while ago, but one that, um, you know, as an example, one that I bought for $210,000 12 years ago that um, you know, is netting somewhere around 60000 70000 a year. Right? Yeah. So uh, if I'm getting a 30% a net from it, do I really care about capital growth? It's paid for in three years anyway. Mm. So, mm. You know, um, so, but in saying that, the property's gone up anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, for me, it's a cash flow. It's, it's a full-on cash flow strategy, so I'll just go wherever the best cash flow is, and growth happens anyway. Um, mm. If it was something where I was doing it to target growth, and, look, people have done that. I know people who've had rooming houses for quite a while. I can use, some, use a couple of examples. Um, you know, the buildings that were used as the block on um, you know, Channel 9, we won't talk about the current block, but... 2018 and 19 was two you know, big old class three rooming houses in St Kilda where people had been running the properties, making money running the properties for quite a long period of time. The buildings were old and dilapidated. Channel 9 came along and bought them off them for $10 million. Hmm. Right? So that was some pretty good you know, land banking as such, if you like. They made some money from running it for a while and cashed out in a big way at the end. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is happening in some of the areas where there's um, yeah, where there's some older properties that have been used as rooming houses that are run down now. The underlying land value has gone up to the point that you know, is it worth continuing running a rooming, a rooming house or just cash out? Um, and mm. that is happening, and that's where we're seeing you know, some placement of the stock with some of the newer build stuff that's happening now as well. And it's yeah. massively needed. Um, yeah, if yeah. we look at single-person households, um, I think the 1960s, that 10% um, of the population was single person households. Yeah, 2000, it was 19.3%. 2010, 24.3%. And that's accelerated over COVID. I mean, I think over the last couple of years where people were living together, they thought, well, we don't like this all that much, and they moved out. And household size actually reduced further over COVID. And most suburbs yeah. you look at now, you're probably 35% single people. Um, yeah, that's, those a, sorts of that's a huge percentage. That's a huge percentage. Yeah. So that stock mm. needs to be replaced. You know, I mentioned a couple that 
you know, a couple of the class three ones that sold Channel Nine, and we talked about the you know, capital value of the underlying land with the older rooming houses, and mm. all of the blocks of flats that were built in the fifties and sixties. A lot of that's not replaced; that's old stock. So there's a massive demand to you know, provide suitable stock for single people. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, you asked before about purpose built or conversion. I, I think purpose built is definitely the superior product because it creates something people are much more comfortable. And I know you're doing a lot sort of outside of the, the main city. Are you getting yep. similar, a lot less, more rent per room being in regional compared to being in sort of the CBD area? Um, yeah, look, we do, we, I mean, we do a bit of both. Um, I prefer regional because the land values a lot less. I've still had good you know, growth in the land for anything that I have had. Um, but the rents, I'm not finding that dissimilar. And you know, there's been a lot of demand in regional. And mm. as before, COVID did push a lot of people out. So we had massive demand in a lot of those regional areas. Um, and I'm really not finding the rents that much lower. Um, yeah, occupancy rates are strong. You know, um, so percentage return has been much better, in my experience. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Look, there's, there's good stuff about Metro as well, but it depends, you know, if capital growth is your play, over what time frame? Mm. And, and you know, regionals, regionals boomed as well, so I, I wouldn't be yes. negative about capital growth in regional areas. It's been great. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's where people sort of got, have to look at the, it comes down to the numbers. Right? Yeah. Um, of, if you're getting a similar, sort of, a similar sort of return, and you, yeah. you, you also raised the point around, yeah, equity is great, but how are you going to access that equity as well? Yeah. And, um, so, you know, these are these are really um, worth considering when you are looking at this, you know, the rooming house, going down the rooming house path, co-living. Um, note then in each state as well, they're not con uh, considered rooming houses. So in Victoria, it's rooming house. In other states, they might be HMOs or uh, or co living. Well, HMO is really UK and Ireland. Um, it's yeah. you know, in Australia, your rooming, boarding, or lodging are the primary ones. New South Wales have bought in a co living policy, so it's yeah. the name of the legislation there. So yeah, yeah, yeah you're so right. Just... And sometimes there's not clear overlap between the policies either. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you're you're really keen to find out and, and, you know, I know we've covered a whole lot today, so thank you very, very much, Mark. But that's only sort of the tip of the iceberg. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you're listening to this and, you're, and it's, it's, it's really piquing your interest, the regulatory side, um, anything, I mean, Mark's been doing this for, for many, many years now, speak to Mark, talk to him about what the options are for you. But really importantly is, is really weigh up the you know, where does this sit in your plan of, of investment or whichever? Um, there are some, uh, we, we haven't obviously touched on the finance piece, but there are new products that are coming out in terms of finance. They really weren't that many before, right? <laughs> which is which is bizarre because it's such a, such a great asset to have. And, you know, from a, from a lending perspective, it diversifies any sort of risk because you've got nine you know, nine incomes coming in or whichever, depending on how many rooms. Interesting, I mean, the interesting thing with the finance that you're touching on now is that um, they're really hard to value is to value because they don't get sold very often because why would yes. you sell it with cash flow like that? So yeah. really hard for them to point to any comparable sales. And then, of course, their view is that, oh, nobody's buying them because nobody's selling them. <laughs> so it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing with finance. Um, yeah. yeah, there is a bit more happening at the moment. Yeah, exactly. So reach out, reach out to Mark if you want to find out a little bit more about sort of rooming houses. If you're interested to to build something, purchase. Um, best email would be info at roominghouse.expert, and mm -hmm. he is on Facebook as well. So drop him a, a, a DM when he's not riding around half of Australia. And thank you, Mark. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you so much. And if you've got any questions, right. pop it into the comments, tag Mark as well, if it's Facebook, LinkedIn or whichever. Yeah. And thanks. We'll see you again, Mark. Take care of yourself. No worries.
If there I'll, are any I'll, specific I'll, questions or something that needs elaborating on, happy to come on again and you know, go into more detail on a certain part of it if that's what people want. Fantastic. That would be great. Amazing. Thanks for joining us, everyone, on this week on the Business of Property. Make sure you visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Business of Property, where you can find all our past episodes. And if you found value in today's interview and today's show, hit the like button so you get notified. So until next time, Mark, we'll see you and everyone else that's joining us today. Take care. Bye-bye.